I don't know about you, but you know, I used to think I chose God. You know, that somehow I had a hand in doing God's work for Him, and that I needed to participate with Him in order for Him to get things done. Are you like that? Do you sometimes think that God needs you or that you chose God? <laughs> it's one of those things that really makes a big difference in the way that you act and react to God because you're either going to put yourself in the place of God or you're going to allow Him to have His proper place in your life. Because the person that trusts in the Lord with all their heart doesn't trust themselves to make any kind of decision without first conferring with God before making a decision. They want to do those things that are pleasing in His sight. They want to find that place where God meets them and then they want to maintain that place so they know what to do, where to go, and what to say. As a matter of fact, God chooses us. We didn't choose Him. He draws us to Himself. He calls out to the world. Come. And if we do, we're blessed. If we don't, then we find ourselves in that very peculiar position of hearing the call but not responding, of hardening our heart or deafening our ears so that we don't respond to God's calling on our life. Because God's call is really one of very simple words, come. And the Spirit and the Bride say, come. And he that is thirsty, come. Jesus said it in the book of Revelation. He said, God says come. I I say come, the Spirit says come, and he that will come, come. But the interesting thing is that we also know that though many are called, few are chosen. Jesus had thousands of people follow him for a while, enjoy the miracles, participate in some of his actions, and even do some of the things that he said. But for a season, they looked good. They did that which was pleasing in his sight. But then one, Judas, betrayed him. Peter, another, denied it. All, like sheep scattered astray, ran away when the time of trial and tribulation came. Many are called, but few are chosen. You know, I, I'm always amazed at how I got saved because I never really had a chance to think of it as me picking God. I always was amazed that God chose me, that somehow he wanted me to be with him. And that just, to this day, dumbfounds me. It, it expresses to me his great love. It shows me how merciful he is. It makes me understand his loving kindness and it gives me a greater appreciation of grace than I ever would have understood. But somehow, I never really had this problem with 
God being the one who initiated in me a desire for him. I responded. I chose to love him. I chose to go to him. I chose to follow him. I chose to do whatever it took and still do to know him in a more personal and intimate way than I ever have in my life. And I choose him to work in me his plan of salvation so that I'm not doing or standing in his way from accomplishing in me what he wants for me today as well as tomorrow. Now, I know, and you've heard them, there are lots of people out there that say they're God's hands and his feet, you know, and okay. They say that God's given you his spirit so they can go off and do what he wants them to do. And I say, well, okay. There are people that, matter of fact, say that they they got to do what God won't do because they're the ones that God has entrusted to occupy till he comes. And they're pretty occupied with occupying. But kind of like that Occupy Wall Street and that Occupy Main Street and Occupy the ports and Occupy this, that, and the other thing. I think people that get occupied usually have gotten the wrong perspective about passing through, like sojourners through this world, that somehow they forgot to ask God whether or not they should be occupied with the world, occupying the world, or occupied with His will. Because, I don't know about you, but man, when I read my devotionals, they kind of make me comprehend and understand God better than I ever did before. They make me realize that in me, there dwells no good thing. That, frankly, if I'm his hands and his feet, he's in trouble. Because, ha, <laughs> give me five minutes, ten minutes, twenty minutes, thirty minutes, turn your back, or whatever it may be. Man, I'm out of here. <laughs> but, when I look around, I see other people. You know, I don't think they're so perfect either. And so, I appreciate God working in me. And I love the fact that he's working on me. And I'm blessed by the fact that he chose me. The drawing of the Father. No man comes to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. From John 6.44. When God begins to draw me to himself, the problem of my will comes in immediately. Will I react positively to the truth? Will I come to him? Will I accept what he has revealed to me? To discuss or deliberate over spiritual matters when God calls is inappropriate and disrespectful to him. When God speaks, never discuss it with anyone as if to decide what your response may be. See Galatians 1, 15 and 16. Belief is not the result of an intellectual act, but the result of an act of my will, choosing to do his will and what he has said. Whereby I deliberately commit myself to him to accomplish his purposes and not my own. But will I commit? Will I place myself completely and absolutely on God and decisions and choices for me? Or do I think that I have a will to help him decide what's best for me? And being willing to act solely on what he says is the only thing that I should desire. For has not Abraham offered up his son? Has not God the Father offered up his son? But no less thing should I do than to obey God in all that he may do or say. People have come to me and said, well, what happens if someone breaks into your house and there you are and are you going to witness to them and tell them about Jesus and, you know, not protect your wife and your kids, you know, and not do those things? And I always think about Abraham, you know, and I think, you know, Lord, people that ask me these questions, do they read their Bible? Do they know what you told Abraham to do to offer up his only son? 
hides it? Do they realize all the circumstances of life that every single Christian has gone through in the Old Testament and the New? To give up their life, to trust you for everything, even like Paul suffering beatings sometimes? So I'm amazed when someone asks me. I'm dumbfounded when people challenge me, when people don't know their Bible well enough to say to me, well, aren't you going to defend your family? Pardon the expression, hell no. I'm not, because I'll get myself killed. But God will, because he can, and he will protect my habitation. Because it says that the habitation of the just is protected of the Lord. So I wonder where and how people get this idea that they are the protector and provider when God says, I am. I have no concept of those people. I only know that according to their faith, let it be so. And they walk in that and I praise God for what they do. But for me, I have to go a different way. I have to be willing to say, God, whether I live or whether I die, I live or die by you. And I let you do for me what I cannot do for myself. If I will, I will find that I am grounded on the reality as certainty as God's throne if I will just do as he says, and not what man may say. In preaching the gospel, I always focus on the matter of the will. Whose will? Belief must come from the will to believe. There must be a surrender of the will, not a surrender to a persuasive or powerful argument or guilting into the kingdom. I must deliberately step out placing my faith in God and in His truth, and I must place no confidence in my own works, but only in God. For God draws men to repentance. It's the love of God that draws men to repentance, and that not of themselves, but God that works in them to do and to will of His good pleasure. Trusting in my own mental understanding becomes a hindrance to complete trust in God. There are the power of all these positive thinkers that come into Christianity and want to make the crossover from their philosophy into the dimension of the spirit and make faith part of their positive thinking philosophy. When the reality of faith is a fruit of the spirit, it's an action of God by placing trust in him, which is the action of faith. Faith is caused by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It's a fruit. It's a developed attitude, action, and intention of the heart causing us to choose to do what God says irregardless of the circumstances we see. Faith is a fruit of the Spirit. Faith, hope, and love. I must surrender myself completely to God. I must be willing to ignore and leave my feelings behind. I must will or choose to use my will to pick the choice to believe. But this can never be accomplished without my forceful and determined effort to separate myself from my old ways of looking at everything. I must surrender myself in everything to God. Everyone has been created with the ability to reach out beyond his grasp. But it is God who draws me, and my relationship to him is the first place But it is but my relationship to him in the first place is an inner and personal one and not an intellectual one. If I don't have that personal relationship with him, then he could not speak to me and I could not hear him and he would not draw me unto the place where he is so I would be there with him to be acceptable, to be understandable, to be relationshipable, to be knowledgeable one-to-one, -one, face to face, having as it were, a personal relationship with him in all realities, physical, emotional, spiritual, dynamic. 
in all things, knowing Him. I come into the relationship through the miracle of God and through my own will or choice to believe. Then I begin to get an intelligent appreciation and understanding of the wonder of the transformation in my life. It isn't a genius that figures out that as you walk with God, as you talk with God, as you experience Him regularly, then you can intellectually understand and comprehend what He's doing in your life. But it doesn't come intellectually and comprehensively first. It actually comes by hearing and obeying Him faithfully. So many people tell me they chose God in their kids' life. God bless them. I'm glad they did. And so many will still say it to this day. But I think we're going to find when we get to heaven that God worked a long time on a person before they ever came up to the place of making a decision to walk with God, to talk with Him, and to follow Him in a personal relationship way before they ever made the decision to actually give, do, speak, or say some sinner's prayer or just get down on their knees and cry out to God and be saved. I often wonder, I often pray, I often hope that all those that I see making these decisions for God aren't really just intellectually making a conscious choice to follow God and not obey because that will be the difference of their salvation whether they follow him or whether they are faithful to him in minor tribulation much less if they have to go through a great tribulation to discover if they are following him or following their idea of him. God chose us but you have the will to believe Use your will personally to choose to walk with Jesus, to talk with Jesus, and to hear from Jesus. Otherwise, you'll never know when he comes, and you'll never know if he's left you here to stay.